Uh, well, uh, first of all, let me tell you I, something which Anushka missed. I am a product of AKTU. Okay. Uh, ah, okay, this works. I guarantee. Okay. You see, technology will always fail you. You know, when, you, when it's in your hand, it will always fail you. So I, I, uh, I did my uh, BTEC from uh, IET. Have you heard of IET? Right, okay. So, uh, and back then we used to be called UPTU. And uh, between you and I, UPTU became many other forms till it settled down to become AKTU. And I think it's a matter of great honor that you all uh, belong to a university which shares the name of the Missile Man. So kudos to you for that. And, and then right after uh, my uh, BTEC, I, I am your standard model. Some speaker was talking about MBA and all that. So I am the standard product. We do 12th from science, then we do BTEC, and then we do MBA. And we, we write the CAT exam. Some of us unfortunately end up in the top 0.1%, end up in IIM Ahmedabad. And, uh, and then after two years of graduation from IIM Ahmedabad, one rigorous life experience, uh, one realizes what should one do. So my life from IIM Ahmedabad, uh, I was the gold medalist of my batch. And then uh, it went to... <laughs> That's really not the accolade I'm proud of. I'm proud of the fact that in 2008, when I was in second year, I happened to have a teacher to teach me a course. And the name of the teacher was Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam. And that's, that my friends is the life changing experience. Because a great teacher can give you a great purpose. And a great purpose can open up faculties and thoughts and ideas and minds in directions which you never thought you even possessed. So for all of you who advocate for self-learning, Google learning, xyzplatform.com learning, Remember, it's only a human teacher which can inspire you to a purpose. Remember that, okay? Now, uh, I worked uh, in Boston Consulting Group uh, all over the world. Uh, that was the coveted job. Back then, you know, the salaries which newspapers report. Until then, uh, I happened to meet Dr. Kalam again. And then he said, why don't you use your intellect, your gold medal, your degree and everything else to change the way the world operates? the way the nation works, the way the society behaves, the way the suffering of the people go through. And that's how I decided to give up a corporate job. And really it's no big deal to give a corporate job. You don't need to clap on anyone who's given up a corporate job. It's, it's just sucks your life out. And, uh, and I landed up in, uh, with Dr. Kalam as the, his OSD and advisor. I was with the government until the very last moment of his life. Uh, in IM Shillong, on a stage not bigger than this, I was with him. I learned from him, I got inspired from him. And that to me is my biggest accolade. Now, when you work with Dr. Kalam, you kind of uh, work with the cutting edge technology. You work with everything which seems impossible, which seems 50 years down the line, which seems 100 years down the line, which seems 150 years down the line. And you work on these things because this may not affect my life, this may not affect even your life. This will affect the lives of children who are not born today. But we do that because we stand on shoulders of giants who gave things which they never saw fructify in their own life. Newton never saw the products of gravity coming out. Einstein never saw the products of relativity coming out. But we cherish it. We enjoy it. We take the benefits of it. So we are entitled to a future not born today to work on ideas which will work in those times. And one of those ideas, and you guys are engineers, uh, what I'm going to discuss now is, is going to be slightly data oriented. Uh, it's probably not, uh, you know, if you, you, you need to pay attention. It's as simple as that. Consider this as your mechanics paper in first year. Don't pay attention and you'll fail, right? So you have to pay attention. There's some data on this. There are some very radical ideas we're going to talk about. And I'm going to talk only about one thing. It, well, Ted does specify 18 minutes. I, I'm pretty sure I'll try to complete in 20 minutes. But it's a very complicated topic. Because this topic has been grappled by history. Since the age man became wise, since the age we grew a cerebral cortex, the outer portion of the brain, we have been grappling with the idea of what is dying, what is death, what does it entail, 
and more importantly, how to conquer it. Religions have been born, gods have been created, concepts have been invented, institutions have been formed to grapple with this idea. And man has, and it's a philosophical question which I will not get into because that gets into a domain which I cannot contest. But I want to talk about the technological side of it. Today, humankind is at the cusp of a time when you can, you can openly talk about the idea of beating death. And hence the topic, immortality. Now, before I get into that, how many of you want to become immortals? And I'll give you a choice to die. And I'll give you an option that you'll remain young in whatever body you choose between 20 years to 30 years of your existence, you remain consistent in that body. You don't grow old, you never die till you choose. How many of you will take it? Right, right, young ones. Okay, professors are happy about this. Some people still choose death, that's fantastic, your choice. But I am here to tell you that if you can live till year 2050, you have a shot at your dream. And you have a solid shot at your dream, believe me, right? Now, immortality. Let's find the meaning of immortality. We've been trying to grapple historically through, through religion, spirituality, to philosophy on the idea of dying. So before we talk about idea of not dying, we have to discuss what is dying. Have you heard the story of Dachiket and Yam? Have you? Raise your hands. How many of you? Right, right. Okay. Some of you are late realizing. Bachpan ki aade hai. Right? Okay, that's fine. So, Nachiket is in a, you know, I, I don't want to dwell in that story too much because we want to get into the technology part of it. Nachiket is essentially a young boy, uh, very persistent, who is the son of a sage who is performing sacrifices. And Nachiket is like, Daddy, why are you doing this? Like, why should you kill someone? And he persists, and the sage is doing it for sacrifice. So the sage is enraged, the father is enraged, and he says, Nachiket, I give you to death. And he goes to Yam. Yam is the god of death. Every religion in every single time has had a god of death. In case of the Indian culture, Yam is the god of death. So Nachiket waits outside the doors of the god of death, Yam, for three days. And then Yam comes out. He, he probably had gone, you know, Yam is a busy man. <laughs> right. So this guy comes out on a Sunday holiday. Good news for humankind. Yam is on leave, right? And he comes back and he sees this little boy waiting probably wailing, not having eaten anything, no food to drink. I mean, yum has no, you know, uh, out-of-the-counter service, right? You don't expect that with Yum. So he's just waiting, no, no food, no water. And this boy, young boy, Nachiket, Yum is like, oh, I'm sorry, buddy, I mean, I made you do this. Uh, can I give you three wishes? For some reason, all religion talk only about three wishes. Three seems to be a magical number. So the first wish is pretty easy one. You know, he says, make my father forget all this because he's really mad at me. And then he talks about, tell me how to make all these, uh, uh, you know, these, uh, uh, these yagis. Tell me all the knowledge so that I can impress my father. Very good. Uh, granted. And always the third wish is always where we get stuck, right? A third wish he says, tell me what is death and what is after death. And then Yam says, oh boy, you asked a difficult question. Not even the gods know what is death. And this conversation goes out and on and on and you have to read it in detail. It's a beautiful conversation of philosophy until Yam gives in and says, I'm going to try to explain to you. Well, it's, it's very difficult, but I'm going to try to explain it to you. And Yam explains death in a beautiful way. Uh, first of all, he says, you know, as a self, you are immortal. It's the body which collapses, which is what you would expect uh, from Yam. Uh, soothes the mind, right? Uh, then he says, you know, life is like a you know, you like a, life is like a chariot, okay? So, the rat, the chariot. The chariot is like the body. Your, uh, the, uh, the horses on the chariot are your senses. The sarathi, you know, the charioteer, is like your intellect. The reins which you control the horses with, the charioteer controls with, is your mind. You are in the chariot as a soul, whatever, you know. I don't know what philosophy you believe in, but if you believe in the soul, the soul is in the chariot. And the chariot is going on the path of desire. And the moment you lose, you confuse one with the other, you confuse the horses with the chariot, or if you forget the fact that there is a rain and the fact that the chariot is just a body, you confuse the meaning of death. Now, I, I, I'm not the most 
religionist person which you can find. But this beautiful philosophy explains one thing to me. Yam explains to Nachiket about the fact that body and mind and existence are three different things. The body is like the chariot, the mind is like the reins, and the existence is what resides on the chariot. Technologically, uh, and now I'll proceed into the technology part of it, we have been kind of working a lot on the body, and you'll, I'll, it'll soon be evident. We have been working on the mind. Remember, if you are an engineer, body is made of organic compounds, largely fermions. Fermions are electrons, protons, neutrons. Uh, your body, what is the abundant, most abundant element in your body? No, it's not. Come on. What is the most abundant mo uh, molecule in your body? Most abundant water. What is the most abundant element in water? Hydrogen. Your body has maximum amount of hydrogen. Number two is? Oxygen. Number three is? Carbon. Absolutely. And then four, five, six, I can go on. And in the universe, what is the most abundant element? Hydrogen. Second most? Second most? No, not nitrogen, that's in the air, not carbon. The second most is helium, actually. Stars decay into helium, and so you can leave helium aside, it is inert, so if you subtract that, the first is hydrogen, second is helium, third is oxygen, fourth is carbon, so on and so forth. So your body and the universe have more or less the same amount of, you know, the elements are in the same proportion, so you are in the universe and the universe is in you. Now, so I was telling you, we have worked a lot on the body, which is made of molecules, uh, and medical science is, is largely focusing on that. We are now working on the idea of uh, longevity of the mind, which is thoughts, which are electromagnetic, largely driven by synapses. Synapses are nothing but electrical pulses between dendrites of a neuron. So if this is a neuron, this is a neuron. Between them, there's a connection. If this connection happens, it's a synapse, and there's an electrical pulse between them. So it's electromagnetic. We're not really sure what is the idea of soul or existence. Uh, maybe it resides in the body and the mind. That's the assumption we are taking right now. Maybe we are wrong. So, so far what we have done with that, as a true scientist, I must say, we don't know a lot. And I will not claim that, you know, I study one book and I know everything. And there's a lot more to read and a lot more to manufacture. But what we know is important, right? Now, death has obviously, which side does it work? Okay, yeah, so that's death, always painful, always, you know, something with a blade, something with, you know, really grim reaper, uh, to, ah, this guy, <laughs> right? So death has always been depicted as pain, scary, something you don't want to be in company with, something that will freeze you to death, cut you to death, you know, kind of, not good. And has always inspired the idea of death, has inspired the pyramids, which is nothing but preparation after dying. Uh, economies have been sucked out of their wealth to build pyramids. Uh, cities were built out of slaves to build pyramids. And then, you know, death and love is a combination which is lethal. <laughs> right? So, uh, Taj Mahal is also something which is inspired by the idea of dying. Now, this is a graph. And this is, this is the graph why I had to get this projector switched on. This is a graph. Can you read it? Or oh, I need to explain it. There should be a laser pointer somewhere here. How does this work? This one? Ah, this one. Yeah. So this is written 1800. This means 1800 AD. That is 2000. And here is 2016. If you were born in the year 1800, as a child, the average life expectancy, you know, that point at which you thought you would have lived, would have been 29 years. From 1800, start expanding time. It remains around 29 years, 29 years, 29 years, 30 years, 31 years, 32 years. Till 1900, it becomes 32 years. So only about 100 years ago, your life expectancy was less than half of what it is today. And then it shoots off. You know what happens here? Louis Pasteur invents, not invents, discovers germ theory. For the first time, we get to know there's something microscopic which can cause you diseases and need to be taken care of. Things like hygiene, sanitation, hand wash begin here. And then it really takes off here, around 1930, 1940. What happens here? 
Alexander Fleming comes up with the idea of penicillin, which kills molds, which kills microscopic bacteria. And you have antibiotics. Antibiotics and germ theory put together have propelled beginning 1900, your life expectancy, which was 32 years here, to 72 years, two years ago, or three years ago now. <coughs> In about 116 years, science has given you at least uh, additional 40 years to live. Thank you, science, for that. <laughs> One man, that's the power of an engineer or a technologist. One man, Alexander Fleming, by statistics, has given each one of us, on an average, 25 years to live extra. So if you ever had a toothache, if you ever had a, you know, a thorn prick, there was a 50% chance you'll die. More soldiers died in wars, many more soldiers died in wars from thorn pricks than bullets. Because you had septics. Small thorns could create septics. Bullets were not killing people. It was thorns. It was dirt. It was germs. And Alexander Fleming solved it. So that's the rosy picture side of it. So if you go by this logic, then you know, our life expectancy is only going up. But scratch the surface. Okay, back, huh. Scratch the surface. This is only for England. I could f only find data for there, but would probably reflect uh, other nations as well. But if a person hits 70, is anybody above 70 here? Nobody's above 70. Good. Uh, so if you hit 70, then what? So if you take the population of everybody who's above 70 years, from 1800 to 2016 again, you only have a blip of seven years. What's happened? So while a lot of people would get to reach 70, but beyond 70 is still a difficult bet. And that is our critical problem, friends. You and I, and people who are going to be associated with this industry, have to work on this problem. This is aging. To conquer death, you have to conquer aging. And that is our thrust. And don't confuse between these two industries. The anti-aging symptom industry, aging symptoms largely are wrinkles in women, cosmetically, and balding in men, right? So these two industries put together, today have $450 billion of market. $450 billion is a lot, it's more than the GDP of Pakistan. <laughs> and many other actually. So, 400, so, sorry, 250. 250 is still greater than Pakistan. Uh, Anti-aging research, however, is still a fledging industry. Now, that startup uh, have been funded between, that's actually 2018, so that's five years, $4 billion.